All right, I'm really honored to support and moderate our program today, which will focus on the contemporary management of brain tumors. I am Ashwin Viswanathan, a professor of neurosurgery and the director of our functional neurosurgery program at Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center. First, I would like to welcome our attendees and physicians from Latin America, the Middle East, and the United States. A major focus of the International Center at Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center in Houston, Texas, is promoting medical education through educational programs. In collaboration with Baylor College of Medicine, we are honored to host the 16th International Virtual Roundtable to our network of physicians, medical societies, and the international medical community as a whole. As I mentioned, today's topic will be the contemporary management of brain tumors. So I'll first share a little bit about the format for today's program. We will begin with our lecture presentation by our speaker, Dr. Ganesh Rao. During his presentation, please feel free to submit questions through the chat box, which is located in the lower right quadrant of your screen. After his presentation, we will open the round table with comments and observations from our esteemed panelists, and then we will open to live questions from you all, our audience. Before introducing Dr. Rao, I would like to welcome our international panelists who will join us after the presentation to share their experiences and observations. Let's first welcome Dr. Mohammed Saeed Bafagi from, South, uh, from Saudi Arabia. Dr. Bafagi is a neurovascular, skull base, and peripheral nerve surgeon. He is head of the skull base surgery program and the directory program director of the Riyadh Neurosurgery Regional Program at the National Neurological Institute at King Fahd Medical City in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Dr. Bafagi received his doctorate in medicine with award from the University of Ottawa in Ontario, Canada. He completed his research fellowship in minimally invasive brain surgery and a fellowship in conventional and complex cranial surgery from the University of Ottawa Neurosurgery Program. We welcome Dr. Bafagi. Our next um, uh, facilitator will be Dr. Nelson Maldonado from Ecuador. Dr. Maldonado is a professor of neurology, neurosurgery, and neurocritical care at the San Francisco de Quito University. He studied medicine at the Pontifical Catholic University of Ecuador, then specialized in neurology at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, Michigan. He then completed his studies with a fellowship at our neurocritical care program here at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. His areas of clinical and research interests include vascular neurology, particularly in pathologies which affect the Ecuadorian population. Dr. Maldonado is chairman of neurology at the Hospital de los Valles in Quito. He is also the organizer and annual chair of the Symposium on Neurocritical Care and Clinical Research. We welcome Dr. Maldonado. Our final panelist is Dr. Pamela Garcia Corachano from Peru. Dr. Garcia Corachano is a staff neurosurgeon of the National Institute of Neoplastic Diseases. Einem. She received the title of surgeon in the 10th Superior from the private University of San Martin de Porres, completed her medical internship at the Arzobispo Loaiza National Hospital, and the specialization in neurosurgery at the National Institute of Neoplastic Diseases. Her neurosurgical training includes rotations in the Jackson Memorial Hospital in neurosurgical intensive care, at the University of Miami Hospital in the surgical neuro-oncology program, with Dr. Ricardo Comotar, and at the Miami Neurosurgical Center in Minimally Invasive Complex Spine Surgery and in Spinal Neuromodulation for Pain. She is currently developing a master's degree in radiosurgery of the central nervous system from the Universidad Complutense de Madrid. We welcome Dr. Garcia Corachano. So thank you all so much for joining us. We will be connecting with you right after Dr. Rao's lecture to get your insights and observations. It is now an honor to introduce Dr. Ganesh Rao. Dr. Rao is a board certified neurosurgeon with a specialty interest in neurosurgical oncology. Prior to joining Baylor College of Medicine as chair of the Department of Neurosurgery, he practiced neurosurgery at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center for 15 years. Dr. Rao has experience in treating patients with both brain and spinal tumors. He treats primary brain tumors, including low-grade gliomas, glioblastoma, meningioma, in addition to metastatic brain tumors. He uses advanced surgical techniques and novel technologies to treat brain tumors, including stereotactic navigation, awake surgery, 
endoscopy, stereotactic radiosurgery, and laser interstitial thermal therapy, also known as LIT. He performs both basic and clinical research to understand the causes of glioma, the most common and aggressive form of brain cancer. He has been funded by the National Institutes of Health for his research, and Dr. Rao's primary goal is to provide the best care for his patients. This includes not only the best surgery possible, but also compassionate care before and after surgery. We welcome Dr. Rao. Thank you. Dr. Viswanathan, thank you for that kind introduction, and I'm, I'm so humbled to be here among uh, such luminaries in our field and, and uh, looking forward to the discussion. So I will share my screen. And hopefully you can see this. So as Dr. S. Viswanathan mentioned, the topic today is contemporary management of brain tumors. Um, and I'm going to focus primarily on um, primary brain, surgical management of brain tumors, including primary brain tumors. We'll talk about high-grade gliomas, low-grade gliomas, metastatic brain tumors, and meningiomas. And I, I will give a fairly... Um, high level view of these things, but we'll talk a little bit about some novel surgical techniques and things that we we're doing that I think are pushing the, the boundaries of treatment for these tumors. I have no disclosures. So I'd like to start with low-grade glioma. These are tumors that have changed in terms of how they're treated over, over the last several years. Many, many years ago, um, a tumor like this might be found incidentally in a patient. A patient may present with headaches or a seizure We'd find a tumor like this that looked somewhat indolent, and we would often counsel the patient that this is something that didn't need treatment at all. These are tumors that are very, very benign. They don't really grow. They don't change over time. And it would be exceedingly rare to take a patient with a tumor like this to the operating room to put them through a craniotomy to remove a tumor that looks almost somewhat indistinct from the surrounding brain. What we got wrong was that these tumors do, in fact, grow over time. We would follow these patients for a few months, maybe a couple of years, and the tumor wouldn't change very much. But we now know that over time, these tumors do change. And we know that if we look at the correct time points in terms of months to years, we see that these tumors grow. Longitudinal studies have shown not, 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 that not only do they grow, but they pick up additional mutations that can make them much more aggressive. So these low-grade gliomas if given enough time, will often devolve into high-grade gliomas, which have a much more aggressive phenotype, and these patients do much more poorly. So over the last few years, these patients have um, been treated very differently. A patient with a non-enhancing tumor like this in the left frontal lobe will undergo surgery. This is a tumor that is located very close to very critical structures, including primary speech cortex, motor cortex, and sensory cortex. And here you can see a grid that's been placed over the brain after exposure of the lesion. The tumor is here. And we're able to identify those critical structures uh, with simple motor mapping. For our, our cases in which the tumor is proximate to speech function, we will often wake the patient up and test speech function. I'll show you some examples of that. But in general, um, this has really become standard of care um, for patients with tumors in these locations. Tumors that are considered low-grade gliomas, if operable, are recommended to undergo surgery. And we use these techniques of mapping the brain to make sure we are not disturbing or at least minimizing injury to these critical structures. After the resection, you can see the sensory and motor cortex is left intact, speech cortex is left intact, and there's a resection cavity here where the tumor has been removed, but the surrounding brain is largely undisturbed. And we believe in a, in a on block or, or peel to peel bank resection technique where we're essentially uh, identifying normal peel boundaries around the tumor and dissecting down to the medial boundary of this and using um, subcortical stimulation, for example, to ensure that we're not disturbing in critical descending white matter tracts. Unfortunately, even despite the best operations, these tumors can recur. So this is the same patient approximately 10 years later, and you can see that the patient has had a massive recurrence, although he did well for many, many years, almost a decade. So we're still struggling with these tumors. We do know that resection of these low-grade tumors, when they present, um, if you can be aggressive, you can delay the transformation rate, what we call the malignant transformation rate, to a high-grade glioma, 
Um, in some cases, some rare cases, particularly in the subtype of oligodendroglioma, we may be able, uh, if they have the most favorable genetic characteristics, we may be able to mitigate that transformation entirely, although I will say that it's somewhat controversial. We now know, thanks to advanced um, next generation sequencing and other techniques, that low-grade gliomas are not one single entity. We know that this is actually several different diseases, and thanks to work uh, that's been done uh, by several groups, right, most particularly the, the Cancer Genome Atlas uh, here in the States, which includes investigators from all over the world, uh, we're, we've been able to subdivide these gliomas into subtypes that give us some prognostic information. So if we look at gliomas in general, and this is the, the, the patient sample from that paper that I just showed you, um, the first branching point for these patients is understanding the IDH status. So this has now become standard of care. Um, I would say in the last 10 years, any pathology lab um, that handles patients with, with brain tumors will be able to immediately distinguish IDH mutant from IDH wild type tumors. The isocitrate dehydrogenase gene is a critical branch point for these tumors. It's involved in the citric acid cycle. So it's really kind of uh, reinvigorated this field of cancer biochemistry where we now have to understand um, these biochemical pathways. Importantly, uh, this, this mutant gene can now be identified with simple immunohistochemistry uh, over 90% of the time. There are some non-canonical mutations of this gene that need to be identified with sequencing. If you have a young patient with a non-enhancing tumor and the immunohistochemistry is negative, it may be worth putting that sample through sequencing to see if they have a non-canonical mutation because then you will know whether or not they have a much more favorable prognosis these patients tend to do significantly better than the patient with the IDH wild type uh, genotype. These patients tend to have much more aggressive tumors. And in fact, we will see how these things will get incorporated into the next WHO um, classification of gliomas, which is coming out later this year. Oops, I'm sorry, I think I'll go to there for a second. Uh, for high-grade glioma, um, I'd like to mention that there are several subtypes of this as well. Um, we, we generally think of these as astrocytomas, glioblastomas. These can be subcategorized as giant cell glioblastomas, gliosarcomas, gliomatosis cerebri. The oligodendrogliomas can progress to an entity called anaplastic oligodendroglioma, and then even anaplastic oligoastrocytoma, although this, this term is falling out of favor. So in current WHO standards, the tumors are really dichotomized by oligodendroglioma and astrocytoma, and then further categorized by their um, um, molecular characteristics. I get this question all the time, how did I get this tumor? And it's really generally unknown. There is really inconclusive evidence to implicate environmental risks. Things like electromagnetic fields, including cell phones, trauma, the intake of certain compounds have really not borne out in terms of their clear causative role in patients with gliomas and, and other types of brain tumors. And they also tend to be quite sporadic. Less than 5% of patients will have other family members affected. Even in familial cases where you may have a father or a, a child that both have this disease, the underlying cause is unknown. We do know that patients with certain syndromes, Lee Fromeni, Turco, and neurofibromatosis will have inc increased risk for these sorts of tumors. Molecular classification is now becoming standard of care in the US. Genomic profiling of a large number of glioblastomas has identified subtypes of glioblastoma that have different biological and clinical behavior. As I mentioned, the isocitrate dehydrogenase one mutation is a key um, identifier for patients with a better prognosis versus worse. Platelet-derived growth factor, epidermal growth factor, receptor, in particular, the EGFRV3 variant, NF1, ATRX, cell cycle genes, and MGMT or, or, the mis, or the DNA repair enzyme MGMT in which the promoter may be methylated. Patients who have the promoter of this gene methylated tend to do significantly better than patients who do not have it. And so this is frequently um, assayed in patients with a glioblastoma, primarily for our prognostic reasons, but there are now some clinical trials that use this as stratification criteria. If we look at integrated diagnoses, which are now becoming much more common from our neuropathology, neuropathologists, you're going to get reports about almost all of these things. 
ATRX, for example, if there's loss of ATRX, that tends to correlate with an astrocytic histology, and those patients tend to do better. So we're now ordering ATRX stains on virtually all of our patients with gliomas. Uh, despite this vast knowledge or understanding of the biology of these tumors, treatment for these disease, this particular tumor type has not changed significantly in the last, I would say, 15 years. The standard of care in the United States right now has generally been surgical resection when possible, followed by concurrent radi radiation and temozolomide, the so-called STUP regimen, which you can see here. There are some variations to this. Uh, for older patients, we tend to shorten the radiation course. So instead of six weeks, we'll do four weeks. Uh, there have been at least two clinical trials um, worldwide looking at the addition of Avastin or Bevacizumab, um, not only for newly diagnosed patients, but for also recurrent disease, and they have not shown any significant survival advantage for those patients. Uh, similarly, there have been trials increasing the dose of temozolomide, the so-called dose-dense temozolomide, and that has not been shown to have any significant um, impact on survival. There are a variety of clinical trials now uh, investigating immunotherapy. The immunotherapy trials have been mixed, um, but checkpoint placade seems to have some benefit for patients in a select group. The most recent study showed that when it's given in the neoadjuvant setting prior to resection, there can be a survival benefit, but this has to be validated in larger studies. So I'm a surgeon, I'm going to focus largely on surgical technique. Um, there is in fact no level one evidence to support the fact that maximum surgical resection uh, has a benefit but many retrospective studies have shown that there is a significant survival advantage if we can remove as much of the tumor as safely as possible. And that in this case is defined by the enhancing tumor. So on an MRI scan, the post-contrast study, if we can remove, um, the threshold generally has been accepted to be 70, 90, 80% of that. If we can remove that much of the enhancing disease, we will have done, uh, we will have provided a survival advantage to the patient. So generally in the United States and around the world, this is considered standard of care. Uh, and this is a paper that I highlight, uh, really one of the first studies to show a significant separation of survival curve depending on how much tumor you were able to get out. This paper, in fact, shows that once you cross the 98% uh, resection threshold, you, you get the widest separation of the curves, but really you start to see uh, an improvement in survival when you cross about 80%. And more recent studies by the, the uh, University of California, San Francisco group have shown that number of as low as 79%. These surgical adjuncts are becoming much more common worldwide. Um, stereotactic navigation or computer-assisted navigation is something that we take for granted here in the United States. We do a lot of brain mapping to avoid uh, damaging functional structures. Intraoperative MRI, which I'll touch on later, is also uh, making uh, significant um, inroads here in the US. A lot of imaging adjuncts or intraoperative adjuncts like 5-ALA or fluorescein, which can light up the tumor and can, be, it can help us visualize the tumor better. Um, are also being used. Uh, they've been, these tech, uh, 5-ALA in particular has been much more available in Europe, for example. It just, it just got FDA approval in the US just a few years ago, and now it's being used much more commonly. And then brachytherapy is actually making a resurgence. Uh, we'll touch on that briefly. So I wanna talk a little bit about the utility of diffusion tensor imaging and identifying white matter tracks. Patients with tumors that are very close to these descending motor pathways um, may be at risk for damage to those motor pathways. You can see how as the tumor is removed and the, uh, the edema settles down, that there's a reduction in the distance between the tumor or the resection cavity and the tract. And if you're not careful, if you don't know where those are, you can actually damage those tracts. So we are now incorporating diffusion tensor imaging into our, into our navigation systems and also um, generally performing quite a bit of cortical and subcortical mapping with stimulators uh, to identify where these structures are. Uh, the intraoperative MRI environment is becoming more common. A lot of centers have a variation in some kind of way to get imaging during the case. And this is valuable because, for example, when you're trying to look around a corner and see if there's residual tumor, you may not see it with regular microscopy or ultrasound. You can see how getting a scan during the operation may help you to identify residual tumor and remove it. Apologize there. Okay. Um, I want to show you an example of 5-ALA. So this is the, um, the, the drug that actually gets metabolized by the tumor. Um, and under bright light, you actually sometimes can't tell the difference between normal brain and tumor. 
but um, 5 ALA, the metabolite photoporphyrin 9, can be visualized with a uh, special uh, filter on the microscope, and now we can see where residual tumor is. And there have certainly been studies demonstrating a significant survival advantage in patients um, when, this when this particular adjunct is used. Um, as I mentioned, brachytherapy is making a resurgence. Um, carmistine wafers have been used for many, many years. Um, they sort of fell out of favor to some extent because there were some complications associated with them and, and analysis of the data showed that there was uh, some wound healing problems. But now people are starting to use this in a different way with high doses of radiation, so the seeds that are now placed into these wafers and also immunotherapy being released from these wafers locally. And so we're going to see over the next few years, I think some changes in how local brachytherapy is used. I also wanna mention, um, post-operative um, changes. So there are things like novel, um, uh, things like tumor-treating fields or the Novacure TTF. This uses alternating um, tumor-treating fields to treat uh, uh, brain tumors. There have been at least two clinical trials validating its use and promoting um, survival. There are some uh, technological challenges to this. The patient has to carry a battery pack and, and shave their head and wear the, the uh, cap for at least 18 hours a day. Uh, but this is technology that is now being deployed, and I see it more and more in, in patients being used. I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about a, a relatively new technology that I'm, I'm excited about that we've used quite a bit um, here in Houston. This is the laser interstitial thermal therapy. Um, a lot of gliomas are not treatable with surgery. They can be in very critical structures like this tumor here in the thalamus, very difficult to get there with surgery. And we're trying to figure out a way to treat these. And we've been using laser with hyperthermia to treat these and trying to equate the extent of laser ablation with the extent of resection. So in this patient, for example, you see a very um, a, a large thalamic uh, glioblastoma. This is biopsy proven. We now, through a minimally invasive technique, are implanting a um, laser probe. And <clears throat> we actually can you'll see here real time, visualize the heat being deposited into the tumor. That's the yellow and blue lines here. These correspond with a certain amount of heat that's being that's deposited to the tumor. And then over time, we've seen some very dramatic results. So it's almost significant uh, removal, I would say uh, regression of this tumor, for example. Uh, we have several cases like this where we've seen reduction in the size of the tumor over time. And this patient actually only was ever treated with post-operative radiation as opposed to concurrent chemotherapy and radiation and is still alive today. Uh, and we've published on our uh, series with this. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit now and talk about brain metastases. So I've focused on primary brain tumors. Far and away our most common um, uh, pathology that we deal with is brain metastases. Cancer rates, as you know, are, are continue to go up. Um, I will say that the, the treatment for this has changed just in the last few years. So this is a paper that's a couple years old now, uh, looking at the use of nivolumab and ipilimumab, so immunotherapy in combination for melanoma metastatic to the brain. 20 years ago, if you had melanoma in the brain, your median survival was six weeks. And now we're seeing remarkable responses to immunotherapy, even for patients with disease in the brain. So an objective response in a patient with melanoma in the brain who got this treatment was 52 um, Patients, so 55% of patients were, got a significant uh, um, um, response to this, this combination. And in fact, 26% of patients got a complete response. So it's really remarkable. And I think it speaks to the fact that we're gonna see a lot of these targeted therapies over time for patients with brain metastases. <clears throat> this is another study looking at tucatinib in combination with standard of care in, in, in comparison to placebo for breast cancer patients with brain metastases and a significant improvement in survival when you offer this uh, combination. Um, so I think what we'll probably see in the next five years is maybe even a shift away from um, the um, standard techniques of, of surgery and radiation and the administration of these immunotherapy or targeted therapies. We've already seen that to some extent as surgery has been replaced by radio surgery. So this is a study that one of my mentors at MD Anderson reported recently looking at the, the, the change, the shift in um, tumor volume, like the patients were taking the surgery. So you'll see here um, many, many years ago, um, the tumors didn't have to be that big um, before we would take them to surgery. Now, because radio surgery is being used more and more at, at, for smaller and smaller tumors, it's not until the patients have present with very large tumors that we're taking them out. 
um, and this trend is, is occurring in parallel with the complete shift of, um, of patients getting treated with radiosurgery or focused radiation um, compared to surgery. Uh, and I would say the management of the brain metastases is evolving even from that point. So patients like this, this is a breast cancer patient who had a metastasis, very large one that we removed. Um, she had significant flare abnormality, but you can see what's happened to the patient after she got whole brain radiation, which was standard of care many years ago. Um, if you look at the T2 weighted image, this is her brain at the time, uh, right before surgery. Now look at it nine years after whole brain radiation, there's significant volume loss. You can see the significant atrophy throughout her brain. And this patient is not nearly as cognitively intact as she was before. The whole brain radiation we know has a significant uh, impact on this, but whole brain radiation um, clearly has a role uh, and it had a significant role. It was proven, it was shown many years ago by Roy, Roy Patchell that adding whole brain radiation uh, to patients who underwent resection had a significant improvement in survival compared to those patients who had just biopsied their tumor. Um, and if we <clears throat> added whole brain radiation after we took out the tumor, the local recurrence rate dropped significantly and they were less likely to die a neurologic death. And if you talk to patients, they, don't, they wanna maintain their faculties or cognitive function um, as long as they can. Interestingly, if you add radiation to, whole, to surgery, you don't see a difference in overall survival, but you do see a significant reduction in local recurrence. Um, we and others have actually looked at the neurocognitive effects of, of whole brain radiation. This is a study uh, published by my colleague, Paul Brown, formerly at MD Anderson up at Mayo Clinic, who looked at the effect of whole brain radiation compared to radiosurgery um, um, with neurocognitive outcome as a primary endpoint. And you can see in this graph that, uh, and I won't belabor this, but these patients were put through a battery of tests to look at their neurocognitive outcomes. And the patients with who underwent whole, stereotactic radiosurgery, so focused radiation to the tumor as opposed to radiating their entire brain, did significantly better and held on to their neurocognitive function much, much longer than the patients who underwent whole brain radiation. Around the same time, we published a study looking at the efficacy of stereotactic radiosurgery to hold to um, observation. We wanted to know in the, in the modern era, if we were able to remove a tumor aggressively, could we avoid um, giving them radiation at all, even stereotactic radiosurgery? Here's an example of a patient who was treated for a, a right frontal metastasis. You can see significant edema. Uh, the tumor is taken out and postoperatively has a good resection. Uh, they undergo radiosurgery, so that just the cavity is treated. We're not giving them whole brain radiation. Um, and the patient does very well. In fact, we were able to show in that study that significant local control um, when you add radiosurgery to the resection. It's actually not as good as whole brain radiation, but it does spare them the neurocognitive um, insult that is associated with whole brain radiation. We are also using um, LIT for the laser for recurrent metastatic disease. This is very challenging. Patients who have radiosurgery or whole brain radiation and then develop progression of the same lesion are very difficult to treat. Uh, it's hard to know if this is a tumor that has come back and just didn't respond to radiation or if it's radiation necrosis damage induced by the radiation itself. And I will say in most cases, it's often a mixture of both. We do have some options for these people. We can treat them with dexamethasone. We can sometimes repeat radiation, although that's, not, that's considered not favorable um, because if radiation necrosis, you may exacerbate or worsen that problem. And the use of bevacizumab has been reported by many groups as being useful. We've been using uh, laser interstitial thermal therapy for this. I'll show an example. This is a patient who had a single metastasis to the posterior thalamus from lung cancer. Had a good response initially, but then had a recurrence just six months later, you see this enlargement, didn't respond to steroids and was progressively getting weaker. We put this patient through LIT, so you see a single laser fiber implanted stereotactically. And then you'll see this video here where we can actually see the thermography filling the, the tumor. Um, and then two years post-op, that lesion is, has actually regressed a little bit uh, and the patient's doing much better. And this patient's actually several years out now doing well. I wanna end by talking about meningiomas. Um, we typically think of these as very straightforward, usually surgical resections that, that you know, we can almost cure the patient. And in fact, most of these are WHO grade one tumors, but there's a, a non-trivial number of these that are atypical or malignant. And these are much more complicated to treat. And my colleague from um, Dr. Bafaki from Saudi Arabia, I think is gonna talk about the surgical aspects of this. I wanna very briefly let you know about some um, um, 
genetic um, uh, or molecular classifications that have been recently reported that give us a better sense of which tumors are going to occur. These can occur all over the all over the skull base or, or the convexity, um, and each have a different approach to these. This is a, a patient of a colleague of mine. I'll show you who has a, a tuberculum cella meningioma at the base of the skull here, sitting right uh, behind the nose. Uh, and this patient actually underwent uh, an approach where we actually can do a craniotomy at the eyebrow. So you can see a very small eyebrow incision as opposed to having to do a very large incision in the patient's skull. Uh, this gives us direct access to the frontal skull base and the tumor can be removed with minimum cosmetic um, uh, consequence. We are now seeing and understanding the different molecular characteristics of these tumors. Many of them have NF2 mutations. Uh, some of them behave much more aggressively than others, depending on their genetic uh, composition. And this is now also becoming standard of care in terms of the pathological uh, classification. So many of these tumors are now being sequenced. It's much more than histology now. Uh, and this gives us a sense. And there are some clinical trials now targeting um, uh, the hedgehog pathway, for example, uh, with smoothened inhibitors to see if we can uh, potentially treat these um, uh, with targeted therapy. So to summarize, I appreciate your attention. Um, hopefully I was able to get across that the management of brain tumors is evolving. We're seeing a lot more targeted therapies, systemic therapies. For primary brain tumors, the extent of resection is an accepted standard. We have a lot of adjuncts now that we didn't have just a few years ago. There are targeted therapies coming online for, for primary brain tumors. For metastatic tumors, the practice is really shifting away from open surgery more towards radiosurgery. We've really minimized the use of whole brain radiation in order to spare neurocognition in our patients. And finally, from meningiomas, again, surgical resection is the mainstay of treatment, but we're seeing more and more acceptance of the molecular classification, and we're seeing newer and newer minimally invasive surgical techniques to treat these. So thank you again for your attention. Um, I hope once this pandemic ends that you'll be able to visit us here in Houston. This is a, a mock-up of our new hospital, which is being built right outside my office right now. Thanks very much. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Rao, uh, for that uh, excellent presentation on the management of brain tumors. Uh, I'll remind our participants that if you do have questions, please uh, insert them into the chat. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a box or an option at the bottom of your screen. Uh, but now I'll uh, welcome our panelists, and uh, first we'll begin with Dr. Mohammed, Mohammed Saeed Bafagi from Saudi Arabia uh, to share uh, his experiences. Thank you so much. I'll just ask you to unmute, and that would be wonderful. Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, very honored and thankful to the organizers of this uh, beautiful uh, uh, activities. Uh, uh, very hard to talk uh, and speak after Dr. Ganesh Rao, uh, after his beautiful presentation. I learned a lot from it, and I hope uh, you do. I will uh, shift the gear now to a skull-based uh, tumor, and very tough to uh, describe everything in uh, five minutes uh, or so, but we'll try to highlight uh, important uh, uh, thing. And I'm trying to move my, okay. I'm going to start with the clifford tumor. Um, uh, differential diagnosis for clifford tumor um, are metastasis cordoma, uh, echidosis, phaseolophora, uh, uh, chondrosarcoma, plasmacytoma, neuron trexist, which is a rare entity can be found in the uh, uh, clifers. These are the two uh, most common uh, tumors that arise from the clifer from the net, net cord. Uh, very important to understand how to make a diagnosis um, as a, an essential a step toward uh, understanding and uh, surgical treatment for these tumors. Um, Perdoma are midline versus chondrosarcoma, bar, bar midline, both will appear um, uh, bright in T2. However, chondrosarcoma uh, will appear as a chondroid uh, matrix versus uh, uh, thumb sign uh, found in Perdoma. Uh, pony fragment can be found in Perdoma versus uh, uh, interlegion uh, calcification can be found in 50% of the chondrosarcoma. Uh, tumor growing into the clifus from intracranial. Um, a famous example is invasive pituitary macrodonoma. Uh, many of these are uh, prolactinomas, and uh, treatment for those are, of course, medical treatment, meningiomas. Uh, and from the clifus, uh, it can be intracellular or it can be pitroclifal um, uh, from the pitroclifal area. 
uh, where uh, multiple approaches can be uh, um, uh, done to attack these uh, pathologies. Uh, transnasal is uh, growing um, in the literature as a uh, uh, way to go for uh, these uh, tumors. Craniofrangioma uh, also can arise from the cella supracellar area and uh, uh, metastasis, or sorry, uh, extend to the clypheus. Baronasal uh, going to the clypheus uh, pathologies uh, or lesions, mucosal of uh, sphenoid sinus or ethmoid sinus, sinuses, nasopharyngeal carcinomas. This is another uh, disease that uh, should be and typically treated by radiation, sequimous cell carcinoma, nasopharyngeal rhabdosarcoma as well. The most common uh, lesion that going to the clypheus uh, or arise from the clypheus are these six um, uh, tumors, mostly surgical, uh, except for invasive pituitary macrodonoma, as we mentioned, if they're prolactinoma or a functional uh, uh, releasing uh, hormone types of tumor as well as nasopharyngeal carcinoma, which is typically uh, treated by uh, surgical intervention. Um, important to understand the basic anatomy, and this is part of what we are uh, now uh, trying to do to teach be people um, and trainees uh, the basic anatomy strategy uh, about how to understand the anatomy in an easy way. There is two phase of the skull base endocrine and exocrine. The crown is uh, what facing the um, the brain, and we came up with the strategy called rule of five, uh, five uh, uh, bone, five bar for uh, every single bone uh, as well. Um, that uh, understanding of the anatomy will make it easy for us to uh, um, uh, understand the approach to the tumor and uh, <clears throat> hopefully uh, uh, attack and remove uh, the pathology uh, totally and saving the patient's uh, life uh, as well as uh, decrease the uh, complication profile. Um, for rule of five, there are five bones making up the skull base, frontal bone, sphenoid bone, thymoid bone, temporal bone, and occipital bone. Uh, for each bone, um, uh, we uh, made it um, uh, made of uh, five uh, structures. These are squamous for the frontal bone, uh, squamous orbital plate, of ophthalmoidalis, which is a cover of the ethmoid uh, sinuses. Uh, supraorbital ridge, uh, which is an important thing to uh, understand when uh, we uh, do, we are doing hypro or transorbital approach to the skull base uh, tumor, as Dr. Um, uh, Ganesh mentioned, um, one of his uh, procedures, zygomatic process, also important uh, uh, structure in the frontal bone. Um, now, uh, medias orbital plate are important when you're attacking a uh, lesion on, or understanding the origin of the tumors and pathology or their uh, extend uh, orbital plate will take it to the orbit of ethmoidals will take it to the uh, ethmoid uh, sinuses. And uh, that will take us to the, to the tumor of the orbit. The majority of uh, malignant tumor uh, in the orbit actually um, uh, represent a direct extension from tumor from, of uh, sinusal um, uh, uh, origin. And the most common interocular tumor seen in children is retinoblastoma, rhabdosarcoma, neuroblastoma, and uh, lymphoma, as well as uh, leukemia. Um, and some of these tumors are um, required only biopsy to be able to do the biopsy or removing tumors. Um, uh, you need to have a full understanding of uh, the or uh, orbital anatomy, of course. Um, um, same um, uh, deal with the uh, ethmoid bone. Uh, they are made up of five parts, cribiform plate as well as uh, castagale, which we call the horizontal plate. Uh, perpendicular plate is uh, uh, what make a good portion of the nasal septum um, and the labyrinth or the mass, lateral mass of the ethmoid uh, bone, which is the, will make up the um, uh, ethmoid cells. Uh, Lemon of abrasia, the medial a wall of the orbit and nasal uh, conchi. Uh, that will take us to the tumor of the sun nasal. Um, they can be defined to benign, intermediate, and uh, malignant. Benign tumor is epithelial, papilloma, adenoma, dermoid, uh, non -epith uh, epithelial. It's very extensive um, uh, differential diagnosis, and these are the most common uh, by far uh, of the skull base uh, tumor because the variation of these tumors are huge. Inverted papilloma is of uh, intermediate uh, Schindlerian papilloma as well as um, uh, angiofibroma and giant cell tumor are important <coughs> pathology that uh, we need to understand uh, as a skull base. 
and uh, highly malignant tumors uh, such as uh, squamous cell carcinoma, um, as well android uh, cystic uh, carcinoma, uh, uh, non-squamous cell carcinoma are common uh, here in the Middle East. Melanoma is not as common uh, in comparison to North America. Uh, of course, for neurosurgeon, most uh, neurosurgeon love to see um, instead of uh, high malignant is the meningioma of uh, olfactory growth. And there's lots of controversies about how to attack these uh, between uh, ventral uh, approach through the transnasal uh, versus uh, uh, transcranial. Important thing, as uh, Dr. Uh, Ganesh mentioned, that to use a technique that uh, does not hurt the patient. Uh, in particular, uh, neurons or uh, blood vessels. If you are not crossing neurons or uh, injuring an arteries, complication uh, goes down significantly. Same thing with the role of five for a uh, sphenoid um, bone. It uh, consists of uh, the body, greater wing, lesser wing, uh, pterygoid, and uh, sphenoid uh, tongue. With all prominent, including um, uh, severe orbital fissure, which is sandwiched between the uh, severe and uh, sorry, greater and lesser wings, uh, uh, optic canal uh, found in the lesser wing, the median canal, and the uh, rotundum. Uh, temporal bone is very complex bone. It consisted of five uh, portions: squamous, vitreous, including a mystoid process, tympanic uh, part, as well as steloid uh, process and the zygomatic uh, process of the temporal bone, which is going to communicate with the zygomatic uh, bone. Septal bone is um, uh, also important for uh, people to understand as a uh, common uh, approach to the uh, skull base uh, areas goes through uh, this area, suboccipital, either suboccipital or retrosigmoid uh, approaches. Um, and now, um, uh, extremely complex and very interesting area, which is the cell or cellular area, um, where it can be attacked through a transcranial approach versus uh, transnasal uh, approaches. Uh, these areas are uh, part of the middle fossa, located in the middle, starting from anterior to posterior uh, of the planum. In the middle of the planum, there is an elevation of the bone called jogum. And then you have a connection between the two anterior roots of the anterior colonoid, that is uh, the limbus chiasmatic sulcus behind that tuberculum. I'm going to finish soon. This is an uh, extensive uh, work from Dr. Lapib and Dr. Kassam, uh, where uh, they show um, uh, the full uh, ventral approach to the skull base, removing all the skull base, showing the brainstem as well as frontal bone and the pituitary gland. Um, the cell paracellular tumor are very important. Uh, that include pituitary um, adenomas uh, with uh, all different types, but also meningioma of uh, the area starting from the cribriform plate, uh, planum, and uh, tuberculum, as well as we mentioned the uh, clyphus. Uh, important complication um, uh, beside the uh, pituitary uh, uh, injury and uh, uh, malfunction is plain and nerve injury, but also very important to avoid injuring an artery, especially the internal carotid arteries. In our uh, uh, work, we have a rate of 2.2% uh, uh, with these, these tumors. Uh, we uh, came up with the classification of the injury, and I'm going uh, to conclude uh, in the next slide uh, after this. And this classification is important to understand, uh, in our opinion, to be able to uh, manage and deal and uh, create uh, an algorithm and communication between uh, physician and surgeon, as well as interventionist, uh, when uh, such uh, severe complication happen. Um, finally, and before conclusion, uh, to take home message, surgical management of skull-based tumor require good understanding of the tumor biology and behavior, the location and the extension uh, of uh, the tumor, as well as planning the proper surgical approaches based on a good understanding of the local anatomy, meticulous reconstruction, and most impor uh, importantly, to avoid complication is do not cross nerve or do not, and do not uh, injure an arteries that will uh, avoid complication. And work uh, with collaboration and uh, coordination with uh, your uh, other surface and colleagues like oculoplasty as well as uh, ENT uh, surfaces. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk, Dr. Bafagi. 
Okay, I'll now turn it over to Dr. Garcia Corochano uh, for uh, her opinions and comments, please. Thank you so much. I'm going to present just one minute. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you very much for inviting me to this prestigious event, Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center, and especially to Dr. Laura Cruzalegui for giving me this opportunity. I am going to talk about surgical oncology for gliomas. For the brain tumor patient, every piece of that neuro-oncological puzzle plays a decisive role to improve post-surgical outcomes. Firstly, one of the key points in the development of neuro-oncology is the multidisciplinary work of different specialties, such as neurosurgery, neurointensive care, radio-oncology, neuroradiology, neuropathology, medical oncology, among other specialties. Take a look at this illustration in which we can see the multiple microsurgical endoscopic or minimal invasive and radiosurgical techniques that we have to treat different brain tumors with the main objective of maintaining the neurological function of the patient. In the National Institute of Neoplastic Diseases, we performed 500 cranial surgeries per year before the pandemic. 40% were gliomas, of which 60% were glioblastoma. We had a great impact in the reduction of cases due to the pandemic, prioritizing the cases with a better survival prognosis and increasing the number of cases for treatment with radio surgery as a strategy for the pandemic. A range of tumor-related and treatment-related factors could influence clinical outcomes. Prognostic factors are tumor volume, histology and grade, patient age, comorbidities, the timing of surgical interventions, and in this point, beyond extent of resection, the timing of resection is an essential question for patients with low-grade glioma. Specifically, the traditional approach of watchful waiting is now being replaced by a strategy of upfront surgical intervention. In our hospital, we perform intraoperative fluorescence guided resection tumor with fluorescein. In this study published in 2015, it was possible to demonstrate the efficiency of intraoperative fluorescence and its impact on the extent of resection. Quickly look at the conclusions. The microsurgical technique with administration of fluorescein was associated with an increase in the rate of total resection and patient survival. As you can see here, our standard neurological technique includes intravenous administration of fluorescein that is concentrated in damaged areas of the blood brain barrier, such as the found in the tumor area. Its concentration is directly correlated with the number of neoplastic cells. Fluorescence helps to differentiate normal tissue from the tumor, thus avoiding damage to healthy tissue and helping us achieve greater resections. We use sodium fluorescein to a concentration of 
five milligrams per kilo of weight during the induction of anesthesia. We recommend the use of fluorescein in reoperations where there is a loss of the normal architecture of the anatomy. And also we use nerve navigation in the most complex cases in which we need to preserve eloquent areas. This tool effectively enables the surgeon to extrapolate the fineness of preoperative imaging to 3D positions within the patient's cranium in real time. To illustrate this point, in some selected cases, we use the fusion of images with tractography and preoperative diffusion tensor imaging, tractography and transcranial magnetic stimulation mapping for neural navigation. And also we recommend supratotal resection. Importantly, incremental improvements in overall survival have been observed beyond the threshold even at the highest extent of resection. More data have raised the question of whether supratotal resection of non-enhancing tissue based on additional MRI detected abnormalities results in better disease control than the chief through gross total resection of only the contrast enhancing. Awake craniotomy, intraoperative cortical stimulation is increasingly being used for the identification and preservation of language function and motor pathways during glioma resection. Another tool that we use is intraoperative ultrasonography. It's a cost-effective and time-efficient alternative to intraoperative MRI for using glioma resection provides images with lower levels of anatomical detail and moreover residual disease less than one centimeter in diameter can be difficult to detect using intraoperative ultrasonography. We use endoscopic technique to access glioma of the optic pathway and third ventricle. Now, let me turn to intrabeam, that is intraoperative radiotherapy. We use this technique for primary or metastatic malignant brain tumors, ideal smaller than four centimeters. And we observe good long term local control results with a median survival about uh, 13 months. That is all I have to say about our experience in the surgical management of gliomas. And we are looking at novel techniques such as thermal ablation therapy for those patients with inaccessible tumors, as well as intraoperative MRI and intraoperative mutational analysis to improve disease control and quality of life of our patients. Thank you so much. Uh, that was really uh, wonderful. Um, uh, this may be a good time to pause, if that's okay, Dr. Garcia Corachano. To uh, we'll turn it now to Dr. Maldonado for a few minutes to share his experience, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Biswanathan, for for that kind introduction and, and great presentation from Dr. Rao, Dr. Bafiki, and, and Dr. Garcia Corachano. I'm an intensivist. I don't do surgery, so that my talk I will try to do as short as possible. It, it is more concerning of, uh, about what do we need to do so the patient. It is, it's an end outcome is positive. And uh, what happens in our developing countries compared to, to what we have heard from, from Dr. Rao especially. So um, in order for this to happen, besides all the neurosurgical um, techniques that you have already talked about, uh, neurosurgery maybe is one of the most complex uh, fields in which technology unified with very specialized physicians and need to be all on board in order to create a very successful um, outcome for our patients. So what, what you guys have there that we don't have in our developing countries uh, begins all the way from, from the specialists, from neurosurgeons. So uh, for example, in Ecuador, we are just beginning with a neurosurgery residency from after a couple of years. And that's because an uh, Italian neurosurgeon, Dr. Laura Botani, uh, decided to come to Ecuador 
And she is the biggest group of neurosurgeons here and, and does about 250 neurosurgery, neurosurgeries um, or, or brain tumors a year. Uh, however, uh, we, we don't have enough neurosurgeons. We don't have neurointensive care units to take care of the patients after the procedures are done. And we don't have neuropathologists. So after the procedure is done, we, don't have, we have pathologists, but for pathologists that see everything. Uh, we don't have neuro-oncologists neither. So the general oncologist is the one who takes care of the, the, the neuro patient, but is taking care of the other patients as well. And, and in, the, in the OR, um, not, every, not every time it's, it's set by, by neuro navigation, maybe two or three hospitals have neuro navigation here in, in Quito and maybe not more than five or six in the whole country. Um, we don't do, a, for instance, a electro electroencephalography, cortico, uh, electrocorticography during surgery, which Dr. Rao was presenting. So we might have a little bit more of problem with our resection because we don't know exactly uh, where we are. And then when the patient goes to the neurocritical care, we, we don't do things like continuous EEGs in the public hospitals. It's the, almost none of the, or very few of the private hospitals we have the, the privilege of doing that. So it is very important to, to figure out that what you guys do and all, and all those wonderful results and outcomes that Dr. Rao was mentioning that how is it improving in, in Baylor and in the first world, the bridge and the gap to our developing countries, it's every time bigger and bigger in neurosurgery and, and, and neuro-oncology. And, and it is very important to create these collaborations because besides the practical part, the surgical part that, that you cannot do if you are you need the hands of a neurosurgeon, but there's other stuff as, as reading EGs or, or as pathology uh, that can be sent abroad and we, and, and we can get the real or, or the, the most definitive pathology in centers like Baylor um, in order for us down here in our countries to, to, to better understand what's the problem, what's the, what is the tumor and to give um, a better treatment to our patients. So uh, my, my point was just to, to show that besides what neurosurgeons do, uh, in order to have a good outcome, we have all this super big interdisciplinary group that needs to be all in tune. Um, and that's something that you guys are very privileged in having and that we help. We, we thank you a lot because we collaborate a lot with you and you, you can give us a lot of input distantly using telemedicine and sometimes transferring, transferring patients. And hopefully someday you guys can come to our countries and and the surgery is here as well and, and create more champions. So um, I will end there. So, so we have a little bit of time for questions for, for Dr. Rao. Well, thank you so much. I really thank uh, you all, uh, Dr. Rao, Dr. Bafagi, Dr. Garcia Corachano and Dr. Maldonado for your expertise and thoughts. Uh, you know, we are uh, getting to the top of the hour, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so if questions come in, uh, you know, we'd love to take them and uh, we'd be happy to respond to them maybe uh, electronically. Uh, so please let us know. Um, so thank you all for your time again this afternoon. Um, if I could just make a comment about what Dr. Maldonado said. I mean, it's challenging, I know, in, in low resource countries to love, you see all this technology and it's almost impossible to imagine that, that it can get there. Um, you know, one of the, there's, there's been a lot of discussion about neurosurgeons going to developing countries, but the problem is they go, they do some surgery and they leave. And then, you know, you, you still need the technology there and that sort of thing. So at some point there has to be a more equitable distribution of that technology. You know, a, a stealth station five years ago is still pretty good. So there may be a, a way for us to exchange, you know, um, or at least, you know, give you technology that's, that, you know, we've gone to the next step, but, you know, ultra, an ultrasound, uh, as Dr. Garcia Corrigiano talked about, is incredibly valuable. And it's something that, um, you know, it's not terribly expensive technology. Teaching neurosurgeons in, in Ecuador, for example, how to use it would, would really help them with the improving extent of resection. So I think there's an opportunity there that we need to start thinking about. Very good points. Any uh, concluding thoughts from our panelists? I have um, a small point about uh, not uh, um, uh, technology being available for the surgeon. Um, uh, we, um, uh, as you know, I did the um, uh, research on minimum phase of uh, brain surgery with Dr. Amin Kassam and his group. And um, part of the research was to go to um, an area where 
uh, you have uh, very low technology and try to create uh, with the local or whatever resources that you have uh, uh, methodology and uh, alternative techniques. Of course, it's not perfect, but uh, uh, it's always available. I can give you a small example uh, for a minimum phase of uh, procedure that uh, in North America, people use uh, the brain board. Uh, I don't know if you, uh, you have heard of that from Nico. And uh, we uh, created this similar uh, uh, methodology that using a syringe, a 5cc syringe and a fully catheter to be able to attack deep seated uh, lesion like the one uh, that uh, Dr. Uh, Ganesh uh, show uh, as a thalamic uh, tumor are being uh, uh, very successful, actually not as good as the new technology that Dr. Ganesh, of course, uh, uh, showed, but it's, uh, it's uh, very doable and uh, patient benefit from it. Um, I think uh, this is one of the direction that you needed, you needed uh, to go to, uh, beside what Dr. Ganesh said. And uh, of course, uh, availability of technology is always good. It will add to the safety of the procedure and the better outcome of the patient. But since you don't have it, then you should uh, think of uh, much, little uh, better cost effectiveness uh, technology or simple things to use as an alter alternative. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your comments and your uh, expertise. You know, before we finish today, you know, Baylor St. Luke's uh, Medical Center would like to uh, recognize and acknowledge, uh, you know, the many partners that we have uh, that you'll uh, see shortly. You know, uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, a number of uh, opportunities to partner with uh, societies and uh, associations uh, throughout the world. Uh, so we thank you all for their support and partnership in today's program. Baylor St. Luke's would also like to invite uh, you all to our next International Virtual Ground Rounds Table on May 28th uh, with Dr. Samir Gamil Matar, who is a professor and chief of the Division of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery at Baylor College of Medicine and director of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery at Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center who will share the latest developments on bariatric and metabolic surgery. Lastly, we would like to remind you that today's session is recorded and remains available in our channel. We invite you to subscribe to our CHI St. Luke's Health YouTube channel for information on our next international virtual roundtables. Thank you all and uh, good afternoon or good, good evening. All right, have a nice day. Thank you very much. Good afternoon and good evening. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ganesh and every panelist, thank you so much for the invitation.